Okay, so let's just quickly revisit this Merkle tree that we introduced at the end of last lecture just to make sure that we really get this concept. Um, so this is a slightly bigger example. Uh, so here we have uh, 16 messages and we want to commit to all 16 of them. And what the Merkle tree structure allows us to do is one of two things. The first thing is it lets us commit to all 16 message messages and have the output of this commitment scheme be a single value. So you can see that um, the top of the tree here, uh, the C value is the actual commitment. Um, the other thing that, that I should have drawn maybe arrows instead of lines, but this is a tree that you build sort of backwards or you, you build from the bottom up. So you're gonna start with all your messages and then you can think of it reading it upwards. So every time you hit one of these H boxes, that means you hash it. Uh, so in most cases, you're hashing two things to produce another thing. It's getting hashed with a second thing to produce another output. Okay, and then eventually you reach the top of the tree and you're left with a single hash. And the most important component is the fact that there's 16 elements doesn't matter. We could, we could double that, we could quadruple it, we could have a thousand elements. Uh, you know, eventually we will build a tree and it will always come up back to this root. Okay. Another question you might have is, well, what if, what if the tree isn't full, right? So here it's full because there's 16, 16 happens to be a power of two, which is, is why the math sort of works out. That's fine. I mean, if, if your tree isn't full, then you just fill it up as much as possible. And then you might have values that don't go all the way down to the leaf nodes, or you can have the leaf nodes filled with dummy numbers like zero or something like that. Um, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter so much. Okay. Um, and, and the reason it doesn't matter is tied to the fact that uh, you don't care about any messages other than the message that you're trying to look up. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So we have this Merkle tree. Uh, you can commit to as many messages as you want, and it will always give you a single value. Okay, now that in and of itself isn't a big deal because you could just hash all the messages that you want together, just concatenate them in a big string. That will also produce you produce one particular value. Uh, it also, can you can hash an arbitrary number of messages. You can do 10 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. Um, so both of those approaches have that same property. Okay, so the fact that we're able to turn 16 messages into a single hash. That's one component of what's interesting about this, this proposal. But the main reason, the reason it's so complicated um, is if I want to prove to you that uh, this value C, um, it's a commitment to a bunch of data, uh, but it's, it is a commitment to one of these messages. Let's call it M12. Okay, so I want to prove to you that M12 is included in this value. So I hashed a whole bunch of stuff together, but somewhere in there, there's M12. Okay, it's one of the things that I that I hashed together. Okay, um, what I can do is, first off, note that if, if I send you all the messages, then that's fine. Then you can repeat this whole process. So if I send you all of these 16 messages, um, you can build this whole tree and you should come out to the same see here okay these hashes there's no randomness that's involved they're just straight up hashes of the messages okay so uh, you can reproduce uh, this c value if i give you all the messages but if i give you all the messages that's a lot of data that i have to give you and you really only care about one okay so the question is can i give you less is there some amount that i can give you less where you can still verify that this property that this message is in this commitment okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you basically all the values that are along the path. So we call this sort of the Merkle path. So all the values that are along this path, I'm going to give to you uh, in order to verify that this C value is correct. And at every step of the way, so for example, uh, consider this output value here. So this output value here, what do I need to know to compute this? Well, I need to know what's on this wire. So I already know that. I've already told you that because it's on the path. But I also need to know what's on this wire. Okay. Um, similarly, to know what's on this wire, I need to know what's on this wire, which you already have because of the path. I also need to know what's on this wire. Okay. And to be very, 
to be very clear, what I don't need to know is I don't need to know M9 and M10. I don't have to compute them and do this. I just need to know what the value is here, okay? What's the value that was the output of this hash? I don't have to see that those tie back to M9 and M10 because I don't care about M9 and M10. I only care about M12, okay? So I, I care that this value is included correctly, okay? And then similarly here, uh, if, if I want to know what's that the, the value on this wire is correct, I need to know this one and I need to know this one, but literally only this value. I don't need to know the whole subtree. I just need to know this one exact value. And then up here, um, I'll need to know these two values in order to, to make that tree. So if we sort of, uh, I'll taint this in a, a different color to show you that these are, these are sort of the helper variables that you also need to know in addition to the Merkle path. Usually we call the whole thing uh, the Merkle path, okay? So you, you have this path, plus you have these nearest neighbors. And the path from, uh, if you have n elements, you put n elements in a binary tree, the length from the root to one of the leaves is always log n, okay? So that's, that's a basic property about binary trees. And here we also have the blue ones uh, but basically for everything along this log n, we're adding one additional value. So what we get is two log n, which is the same as log n. So anyways, this, it takes log n. Um, and as I noted last class uh, or last lecture, uh, log n is very close to one. It's a lot closer to one than it is to n. So the fact that this is a logarithmic speed up, that's, that's actually really good. Um, so this is the whole Merkle tree construction. And the main story here, uh, just to remind ourselves, is um, it has size, a fixed size, so whatever the output of our hash function is, and it doesn't matter how big n is. And if we want to reveal that one element is in the commitment function, uh, we can do that in log n steps, or I can give you log n hashes, hash values, and you can look at those and you can convince yourself uh, that it's in this value, okay? Now, the final thing is, I'm saying this, I'm asserting that, for example, you don't need to know this whole subtree. You just need to know this value. But is that really true? Like, how, how can you, you know, how can you be sure that these things are all right if you're not seeing them, right? And so that has to do with the collision resistance of the hash function, okay? So in order to create, in order to commit to this message, right, it is true that there might be some other value here that when you hash it alongside with the value that's here, it produces the same hash. Okay, so if, let me hover my mouse correctly. So there's the actual value that's marked by this star, and there's the actual value that's marked by this star, and it's true that they produce this hash. But there are two other values. There's, a, there's probably an infinite number of other pairs that would produce this hash. That's called a collision. Okay, but finding collisions we know is hard. Uh, this hash function is collision resistant. So we're never going to be able to find them. Okay, so if I know that, if I know one path that M12 that links down to M12, that's the only path I know. There's, there's no other path I could possibly know. If I, if I knew a different path, I'd break the collision resistance of the hash function. Okay, so that's, that's the Merkle tree, um, the Merkle tree construction. So let me uh, just just make some notes about it, and then we'll we'll move on. So the the root is called the the Merkle root is a binding commitment to the entire set of messages. The commitment itself is 256 bits if we're using SHA-256 or whatever uh, the output of the hash is. And even though I didn't formally prove it, but I, I suggested to you that collision resistance is the important property here. 
we really need all 256 bits here. Uh, we can't truncate it down to 128 bits or 40 bits or something like that. Uh, if we do that, we're going to break collision resistance. And if we break collision resistance, then the integrity of this tree is not going to hold. Um, so the commitment itself is 256 bits, um, regardless of how many items. Okay, so that's, that's a really cool property. And uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but I'll just, just to motivate this, um, Bitcoin's going to use these Merkle trees somewhere. And uh, it's going to compose this with another thing called the hash chain. It doesn't really matter, but basically if you go into Bitcoin right now today and you pull the latest Merkle root, um, actually you, you pull what's called the block header out of Bitcoin's blockchain, what you're looking at is the hash of something. And what it ends up being is not just the hash of a couple of you know, financial transactions that happened recently, it actually ends up being the hash of the entire history of Bitcoin from the very first transaction that was ever sent, which was years and years and years ago, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, so, um, so, so that's a lot of a lot of a lot of data that's that's being basically funneled into this one 256 bit value. So it's really cool that you can you can do it and make it so succinct. Um, for the Merkle tree itself, not this doesn't apply to the blockchain itself, but for just the Merkle tree, um, the the other thing is that uh, you can um, you can open the commitment to a single value. And you can prove to someone else, you have to send them some value so they can confirm it. Uh, but the number of values that you have to send uh, is, big O just means approximately, you know, worst case asymptotic. Uh, it's going to be log n, where n is the number of items that you store. Okay. So if you store 10 items or 10,000 items, you always get a 256-bit commitment. But if you store 10 items or 10,000 items, the amount of items I have to show you to prove that one particular message was in that commitment does grow, okay? So it, it, is, it is more complicated. It's, it's, a, it's more values when it's 10,000 as opposed to 10. Um, but it's not that much more, okay? Because it's a logarithm uh, it doesn't grow nearly as fast as, as a linear algorithm, okay? And that's because this path, you know, bigger, more data means bigger tree and bigger tree means uh, the path is a little further down, okay? But the number of nodes that you can store at every level, it doubles uh, every time. That's the property of the binary tree and exponents grow really, really fast, okay? So you don't need a lot of levels of the tree to, to hold, you know, huge and huge, huge amounts of data. Okay, so how would we use this in practice? Um, what we would do is uh, basically someone would assert, I have this huge data set. You probably don't care about all of it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a single representation of it. Uh, so they would send that value to you and you would store it. And then later when they wanted to prove that, that some particular data was in that data set, then they would send you the path and you would just make sure that the path actually comes out to the same value you were given the first time that you were given that value, okay? Now, Merkle trees are also hiding to an extent. Um, so they, they can have some hiding properties. Um, so for example, if I show you M12 and I show you this path, right? Not only do you not know what M15 is, uh, you, you may actually, it may not be possible because of the pre-image resistance properties of the hash function to, to even guess. Uh, what M15 is, okay? Um, you have to be a little careful though. Uh, so for example, if I give you the path to M12, um, I do have the hash of M11, okay? So I don't have M11 itself. I have the hash of M11, 
Because of pre-image resistance, I can't go backwards. So I can't start with the output of this hash function and figure out what M11 is. But if I have a guess, I'm like, okay, I think M11 is this one value. I can certainly take my guess, I can put it through the hash function and see if it matches. And if it does match, then I know for certain that that's what's committed there, okay? So in Bitcoin, because these are what we call half commitments, meaning that they're binding only, they're not hiding, we're not gonna care about that particular property. But later there are some protocols that I haven't decided if we'll get into them, we'll probably talk about like, uh, there's this thing called proof of solvency. And in proof of solvency, you actually want a hiding property. It also uses a Merkle tree, but it needs to have that hiding property as well. So um, I'm just floating the idea that hiding needs a little more thought uh, so that eventually when we get there, um, you know, maybe you, you, you'll remember me saying this, but for now we're just, we're really just concerned with the, the binding property. 